Welcome to the Digital Marketing Victories Podcast, a podcast about the realities of digital marketing. Listen in each month to learn about the tactics and strategies, soft skills, and technical requirements that go into digital marketing success. I'm Catherine Watsyei Ong, owner of WO Strategies LLC, an organic traffic consultancy. And I'm Jim Keeney, owner of Federal Web Consulting and founder of DAP, the platform for the engagement economy. Welcome. Let's get into it and celebrate our victories. Hi there. I think you're really going to like today's interview with the CEO of Marketing Mojo, author of a book, Data First Marketing, and my SEO mentor, Janet Driscoll Miller. Janet and I go way back to the early days when we were part of an organization, a listserv called DC Web Women. That was when both of us were more engaged in the web creators part of the digital space. And we've spoken together over the years about SEO on the same panels, and she's let me hire dynamite team members who had left her Charlottesville agency to move into the DC metro area. Um, Janet's been doing digital marketing for 15 plus years. She's an advocate for generating data-driven marketing transformations for years, both at her agency and with the clients she works with. She, in this interview, shares some really great processes and tips for how to use data to move the needle on your campaigns and for how to build more data-focused integration that benefits your marketing work. So without further ado, here's the interview with Janet Driscoll Miller. All right. So today we're here with Janet Driscoll Miller, president of Search Mojo. Janet, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you got started with digital marketing? Sure, absolutely. So I've been running my agency Marketing Mojo for 15 years now. It's the 15 year anniversary is next month. And I got my start in digital because I was really fortunate to come out of school, out of college at a time when the internet was really starting to take off with the World Wide Web. And I'm a creative person and I'm a real analytical person. And so it just brought the two things I love together. And it was the perfect fit for me as a marketer. So I got started real early, like in 96. <laughs> I'm an old girl. <laughs> Been around for a while. Well, and I want to thank you because you sent us a copy of your book, Data First Marketing, How to Compete and Win in the Age of Analytics. And I really enjoyed it. Can you tell everybody what your book is about and how you decided to write it? Absolutely. So, you know, and running an agency for 15 years and working with a a wide variety of clients, I see some of the same problems over and over. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. doesn't matter if you're in B2B or B2C. It just is the same typical issues in digital marketing. And so what we decided to do was I wanted to write a book about the process we've used essentially in our agency over the years that have helped us make us successful for our clients, help make our clients successful. And it's a framework. It's a process that we use. And it's also a mindset. It's about putting that data first before you think about anything else. Because I think people are ready to jump in and they think, hey, I can just put a credit card down with Google ads today and I can get started. And that's a great eager mindset to have. However, The reality is you really need to do a lot of planning before you throw up that first campaign. You need to think through it. And I think a lot of people don't always do that. And in the end, they end up regretting it because of the back end, they don't have all the data that they wanted that will end up telling them what they really need to know. So that's really why we wanted to write the book. So at a high level, can you describe that process when you engage with a company that's you know, really focused on traditional marketing and you're trying to move them towards the digital marketing landscape. Can you just give us a high level overview of the steps that you would take them through? Sure. I'll tell you that one of the things that's hardest is actually not just moving people from necessarily traditional to digital, but moving them, moving the needle in digital itself. So many people that we work with have started off really focused on measuring engagement and engagement's wonderful, but that's not what your CEO cares about. Frankly, they don't care about the engagement. They don't care how many people read this great blog post you wrote. What they care about is revenue. And especially in times like we're in now where things are really tight for a lot of companies, it matters more than ever. And so how do we get started with that? Well, we we have to crawl before we can walk, right? We have to help move them down a path. So I, I have a continuum that I use that starts with things like something basic like impressions. And we start with measuring that 
And then we get all the way down to ROI and we just keep moving down that path. Usually the clients are pretty receptive. They just don't always know how to do it. And that's why they hire us because they don't know how to get there. And they know there are demands from their CMO or their CEO that they just don't have the answer to. They don't know how to get there. And that's where we, we help them get there. Excellent. So setting in place a, a data-first marketing approach inside an organization, it seems like you would require changing organizational attitudes. So, so you're walking them down this path, but right up front, can you describe when you run into kind of resistance and things of that nature, how you, how you deal with that on a, on a kind of functional level? You have this quote inside the book that I just thought was so perfect for our audience and the focus of the podcast, where the quote is from David Waller's it's Harvard Business View Review. And the quote was, the biggest obstacle to creating database businesses aren't technical, they're cultural. And I thought that was really, really struck me because I think I've seen that as well. So can you share any uh, stories or tips around how you've been able to successfully nudge organizations into integrating data into their larger marketing efforts? Absolutely. And, and I think it's a two-part approach. It's There's not only just the cultural impact with the marketing team themselves and making sure the marketing team has that cultural understanding and embraces data, but it's also the rest of the organization that you have to work with, your partners in the organization, the groups like the sales department, right? How do you get them on your side to give you the data that you sometimes need from them? With groups aside from the marketing team, I would say that the real focus is telling them what the benefit is to them. There's a lot of benefit to the sales department if marketing can create better campaigns, more effective campaigns that drive better leads, then they're going to get more sales, which means more money. (laughs) So it's really, you know, that's an easy sell, right? I mean, there are some organizations that are very reticent to to give that data out. But when you can move that needle with other parts of the organization to get the data you need, then, you know, you're going to be more successful to meet their needs as well. Now on the marketing team side, there are some folks I think that have trouble embracing this new love, new marketing, basically. I mean, there are people who are probably about my age who are old school marketers who really didn't get to come up through digital. And that can be really tough. But there's also the the challenge that you have people coming out of college today who I think probably feel really eager and ready, but the reality is that the college does not typically educate them on the newest things. In fact, when I went to, I went to James Madison University, that's my alma mater, and I went back to do some consulting with them. They asked me to come back and talk to them about marketing and the curriculum. And as we talked about it, they admitted to me that it takes 18 months or more to get something into the curriculum, which is eons in our industry. I mean, everything could change in 18 months. So that's a real challenge for colleges and universities, but it also means that people coming out of school, even if they have some level of digital experience, actually have very little digital experience hands-on. And so there's this real divide. You have some people who have been in it for years, who who know it really well. And then there's some people who, there's a lot of people actually, who come out of college and they got just a cursory review. So you have to be willing to train and coach in your organization. And that means creating not only that mindset of saying, we want to always have a change culture here. We always want to be doing better. We want to improve upon what we last did, but also Uh, making a safe environment for that and coaching them through it. Because, you know, once I think a lot of people get out of college and they think I'm done, I don't have to learn anymore. That is not true with digital marketing at all. (laughs) You have to keep- It's just the beginning, right? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So so really helping them through that is key. So I know you've also coached a lot of young people in your agency over the years. It's kind of your model is grabbing some real smart young people and coaching them up, which I've done too in my past. But do you have any things that you've been able to use to vet out whether somebody's got the innate DNA to work well in digital marketing, particularly this data for first bit? So you've got a really eager college student, but that doesn't 
in my experience, that doesn't always mean that they work. And I'm just wondering whether or not you've seen that as well, whether you've got some things that you use in the interview process or that kind of stuff to vet out whether or not a college student, while they might be eager, also have the right gumption and the DNA to sort of work in the digital marketing space. One of my favorite interview questions is I ask people if they're more analytical or creative. Mm. And there's no right or wrong answer. It's just tell me more about yourself. And when someone says, I am a very creative person and I like being creative and I like creating websites. And when I see things like that on their resume, where I see like they're very artsy and they like doing the artistic side of websites, I have a lot of caution there because I don't think they'd be happy in the job I'm, I would have available for them because I spend most of my time and I'm sure both of you do too. I spend a lot of my time in spreadsheets. Just before right. we decided to do our interview today, I was in a spreadsheet. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I don't think creative people feel very happy in that type of role, but analytical mind thinking is very important. I look for maybe specific classes or majors in particular, I like economics majors because mm. they like numbers. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that someone who's a marketing major doesn't like numbers, but someone who's in economics really likes numbers. And someone who's in marketing can also do really well with that. But I like to hear about their projects that they've worked on. I'll ask them questions like, what was your big takeaway from this project? And how did you measure that? Like, how did yep. you measure your success in this project? And sometimes they're limited, right? They're only limited by what the school gives them. For instance, I worked with a lot of folks who did the Google Online Marketing Challenge, which is no more, but for many years, about 10 years, Google ran an ad challenge for college students. And it was fantastic, but Google did not measure people on conversions. They measured mm -hmm. them on things like clicks which to me is sort of irrelevant. I really care about conversions. So I had to really, you have to still give them some leeway there on measurement because they, again, they don't know what they don't know, but hearing them say, well, I thought about measuring this way, or I thought about measuring that way, or giving them a, a question and asking them, here's a scenario. Tell me how you, what you would measure, use to measure success in this type of scenario. Hearing those types of thoughts really helps you get into their mindset and the way they think about measuring their success. In defense of the creative types, what <laughs> the other way I come at it, because you're absolutely right. It is that odd or different combination of, you know, being able to think, think expansively about opportunities and persona and kind of the creative things that will resonate with people. But at the end of the day, it needs to fit into a process that is measurable and results oriented. So what I'll often do is when I um, talk to somebody who is a hundred percent kind of design focused for websites and things like that, I'll ask them about a design specifically how did you come up, how did you decide that was the best design for that particular purpose? And then listen to the way they talk about it. And the people who, you know, fit are the ones that have, you know, are either constantly forming or have a structured process for deciding which design is going to be appropriate in a certain circumstance. And you can see them going through a mental kind of checklist there. And that makes a big difference. That shows that inclination to not only be creative, but also to make it measurable at the end of the day. I would also argue that persona should be based on some data. <laughs> Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. During my agency days, I saw a few that were very suspicious is all I'm saying. My, <laughs> my point being though, that it's all about experimentation and you're constantly going to be fielding, you know, pressure from the sales uh, force, pressure from the product management group, et cetera, to try new things and to try new campaigns. You know, where the rubber meets the road is, okay, if we set this up, how do we measure it for success? And what is the definition of success? Mm -hmm. So I'm also really curious, since I, I actually had a sales role back in my, back in the day about aligning the sales and marketing part of your book that you talk about, because it's certainly... Obviously, I had a different approach personally because I was doing the sales and I'm a marketing person. But when you're walking into a sales team, 
And I realize they are driven by leads and they have commissions and that sort of thing. But how have you seen over the years that you've been able to persuade them to give you the data they need and to integrate with them marketing and sales that is? It is very tough because in some cases it's very proprietary information, right? In some cases I've told them if it's proprietary, you can give me blinded information. I just need an aggregate or I just need to see down to a record number. I don't need to know the person's information, the person's name. I just need to have a, a basic understanding of where we're tracking through. But it can be very difficult. I've got a client right now who said to me, sales will never release this information. And I said, again, we're here to make sales successful. That's our job. That's our job as marketers is to see sales success. And so if sales does not perceive us as an organization, as a marketing organization, as helping them and being able to really be their, their champion, then what's the point? I mean, honestly, that's a big part of what we do. And we have to ask ourselves and ask sales, well, what are we not doing that we should be doing? Now, I'm sure sales will have many answers to this. I have gotten so many great answers from sales over the years, like, you only send me Gmail email addresses or, you know, something like that. (laughs) And, And that's not quality. And we have to have this conversation with, yes, it is quality, but not everybody wants to hear from you immediately with a bunch of sales pitches in their inbox for their office email, right? We have to have those conversations. It doesn't mean those leads are illegitimate in some way. So it's really starting that conversation and really, you know, really working away at trying, you know, chipping away at the, the unfortunate, sometimes I think, I think a bit combative history some, at times between marketing and sales to really get the information we need. And, and like I said, you got to crawl before you walk and we'll get there, but just get what you can as much as you can, as long as you can and try and integrate as much as you can. That's the other, I think, big challenge here is making sure your data for marketing flows through to sales, even if they don't have a flow backwards to marketing that's automatic into your marketing automation or other types of systems, at least be able to get that data from them at some point, like maybe once a month or what have you, so you can review it. But it is a real conversation that needs to take place. When you first meet a new customer, Is there a diagnostic process that you go through that allows you to raise red flags and kind of know in advance that you're dealing with things? For instance, you have that marketing maturity survey in chapter four of your book, which I thought was really good. Do you use tools like that to kind of elicit from people, from an organization up front, enough of an understanding of where they stand so that you can make you know, you can go in with your eyes wide open instead of, instead of discovering these things kind of halfway through the process. Yes. It's always fun when you're peeling back the layers of that onion and you have 15 <laughs> more layers. It's so great. <laughs> uh, it's always and good it to all, know that stuff up front. It's always good to know. Um, and you peel it back and it always comes down to one developer in a back room somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. There he is. Yeah. One of the things we do right from the get-go is I ask clients, how they measure their success. And you'd be surprised at how many marketers really don't have an answer to that question <laughs> yeah. or aren't measuring things right from the get-go they should be, which yeah. is another reason we wrote this book, trying to encourage people to be focusing on business problems and business results rather than just marketing results. And what we, what we may value in marketing isn't always what the CEO values. So we start with that conversation and that tends to throw up a bunch of red flags right Mm. away to say, Mm. okay, here's, I can already see where the holes are. But to your point, yes, we have an intake survey that we are doing with clients to understand, similar to the marketing maturity model, to really Mm. understand where are they in this, in this journey and what holes do we need to help them fill? Because ultimately, as a marketing organization ourselves, a digital marketing organization, as an agency, we measure ourselves by the success of what we do for our clients and they measure us that way. And so if we wanna stay on board with our clients and we wanna stay in, in business, we have to be able to prove to them our success, that we're meeting their goals. Whatever those goals may be, we have to show that they we're meeting those goals. And so measurement is so key to us we want to make sure we're getting it right from the get-go. Do you find 
them moving the goalposts on you during the process of the engagement? And how Sometimes. do you handle that? Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes I actually started off doing web design years ago. That's probably how I met Catherine originally. Wow. When we were in DC Web Women and mm -hmm. I was doing some web design. And one of the things that as a creative designer, you have to be able to do well is you have to be able to get very specific information from people. Like I had a client one time who said she really liked the Donna Karen website. She's a designer. She's a fashion designer. She actually is just a phenomenal person and I really love her, but she didn't always give me specifics that I needed to design her website. She'd say, well, I like this website and I like all the open space. And I'm like, so you like it without a lot of words on it is what you're trying to say. Well, no. And then like, you have to like try and dig with her. <laughs> I think, you know, getting to the bottom of what someone's really thinking, sometimes people are not clear in their communication about what they really truly mean. They can be a little bit vague. And so it takes actually digging with them and that questioning to really understand, well, what do you mean by, I want to measure engagement? What does that really mean to you? And really digging down to understand what that means for them. So just to pivot a little bit, you talk quite a bit in the book about, you actually, I think you have a whole chapter for marketers that want to be more data integrated and data savvy. And so you talk about how marketers need to use data to persuade and to measure their campaigns. So I'm just kind of wondering if you could talk through any tips that you might have for marketers that might be new to that or stories you have of how you've been able to use data to really persuade or support a marketing strategy that you had in place? Absolutely. One I have even from before I even started my agency, I worked for a company called Web Surveyor and love that job. It was a highly analytical type of job. It was an online survey company. It used to compete with SurveyMonkey. And I decided to minimize our homepage to make, I did an A-B test. I, I mentioned this in the book. I wanted to minimize the selections because there's a really good book by a guy named Barry Schwartz. It's not Barry Schwartz from Search Engine Land, but a different Barry Schwartz <laughs> called The Paradox of Choice. And if you give people too many choices, they become overwhelmed. And home pages are kind of like a table of contents. They just have a lot of stuff on them. And I look at it as a place that you go to find where you really want to go. But if you have too many choices, it can be really overwhelming. So we decided to minimize it and just really have the main selections, almost like the main navigation. And that was it. And that was our homepage. And it was nicely designed and so forth, but it was very minimalistic. And we did an A-B test and we found that we got 50% more free trial signups from the minimized homepage. Mm -hmm. Now, the CTO and founder of the company came to me and he said, I want you to take this homepage down. I don't like it. I don't like the way it looks. I want it down today. Go back to the old one. And I said, fair enough. But what if I told you that this new homepage gets 50% more free trial signups? Would you still want me to take it down? And his answer was, well, okay, then leave it up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's amazing what could happen when you have that kind of data at your fingertips in a conversation with somebody. And, and again, I'm just a, I'm a lowly employee uh, working with the founder of the company. It's very important to have that information right there because what's he going to say to me? No, I'd, I'm, my aesthetics are more important yeah. than the, the success actual of our company. Again, actual conversion, that. right? Right, exactly. <laughs> Sometimes it sounds, it seems like that, doesn't it? You touch on something that's, this is a bit of a digression, but you touch on something that I have been working with for uh, a while with my clients, which is the homepage is no longer the homepage in the new world. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, you know, because of Google and Bing and all that, a lot of, you know, a lot of companies are now basically a constellation of homepages rather than one single homepage the, yeah. you know, way back when you and I started designing websites, it was like, okay, we're going to have a 10 month argument about how to set up a menu structure that covers everything in the website. And now yes. I, you know, now I tell customers, no, we're no longer library technicians. <laughs> People don't come to websites that way. They come to landing pages. So, so I'm curious in your own work recently, have you been working with companies to 
kind of get them off the, oh, the homepage has to do everything into more of a, well, we need to have content clusters and have multiple different landing experiences depending on which target audience and which keywords and things? Yeah, I think that's incredibly important for SEO. I mean, Google has helped drive a lot of that, frankly, and, and thankful for that. I'm not always thankful for all the things Google does, <laughs> but I'll be thankful for that because it has gotten people away from this feeling. I remember working for a company called Software AG. Uh -huh. And when I was working there, the fights we would have with every yep. department wanting something on the homepage, right? The yep. real estate was so valuable on the homepage. And is it really though? Because now you don't need that. You know, people, as you said, Jim, can go right to a page. It's a landing page essentially on your website. And that's what you really want. You want to get them to the place they need to go as quick as possible. And so I don't really see too many arguments anymore about folks uh, wanting to focus as much on the homepage. However, I do still see occasionally the focus being on traffic to the homepage. And I tell them that's almost irrelevant traffic because if they drop off on that page, they're right. no good. Right. They're no good to you. So, you know, what we look at a lot of times is something like CRO testing for the homepage to see how we can get more people to stay or more people getting to the destination they really had in mind. Like I'm working with a large bookseller right now and they have all this other garbage on their page. But really when people come to their homepage, they are looking to put in an ISBN a book number, right? right? To find the book that they want, the specific book. They don't care about all these other deals going on the page or books in my state or whatever. I, who cares? No one cares about that. And we can see that through the data as well. And so I, I literally said to them one day, I was like, you know, you should just go radical. You should just make the homepage a search box. And that's right. it. Right. Because everything else is irrelevant. <laughs> it worked for Google. It worked for Google pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so underneath the covers, technology plays a really critical role in moving towards data driven. But in a lot of organizations, there's still you know there's a lot of dynamic tension there. How do you work with the marketing department and the technology department to get them to work as partners in this process of changing? That is a great question because that is oftentimes I find even in SEO especially. I find it to be the, the technology department will often be the, the cog in the machine. They're the one that we have the stopgap situation with because of backlog. So a good technology group, <laughs> and I don't, I don't mean to be super, super judgmental here, but a good technology group who is led by a great CTO or CIO is gonna prioritize their work based on revenue right. and impact. And I will tell you, the bookseller, we had a situation this summer where our Google Shopping ads went down mm. for a time, Google Shopping being their number one revenue source. And it went down for a time because they had added something to the home, to the checkout process. It didn't need to be there. Mm. And it was pretty extraneous. It was optional, but it was there and Google didn't like it. And Google likes to every once in a while, just throw a lovely rejection at you and say, you have to fix this thing because it's not like we like it. It's not our best practice. So we asked them to fix it. And we told them, this is how much, we gave them dollar figures. We said, here's the numbers. Here's what you're losing every single day by not fixing this problem. Mm. And yet still, it could not be prioritized over other work for two wow. and a half months. Wow. And so they just lost a bunch of money. And Luckily, the people we work with in the marketing team understand that had nothing to do with us, but it is very frustrating when a technology group does not listen to a business case. They really need to be prioritizing by business case. If you are in a situation where they don't, it's, it's really difficult. But if you're in a situation where most technology departments, CTOs, CIOs, they will prioritize by business case and say, who is, how is this going to have the most impact on the organization? What's going to have the most impact? And then they will go ahead and prioritize your work if you can show the impact on revenue. This is why this is so critical. So you may have to go to them and say, I can't prove the impact on revenue until you do this thing. And then I can, mm -hmm. but at least, you know, showing that business case with them, sharing that, so helpful because most of them prioritize their work in that way. 
Well, and I think you're moving towards, you're trying to move towards an infrastructure where you can stand up an experiment in very little time, mm -hmm. get it out there, measure the results and, and, you know, get rid of the ones that don't succeed. We had a very interesting conversation with the head of marketing at, at uh, Fleetio. And she, you know, she was lucky because it's a digital organization. And when she came in, they had nothing. And that was something that she talked about a lot about is over the last five years, she's developed a marketing team where they're constantly <coughs> experimenting. They're, you know, developing new persona, developing marketing campaigns around those persona, but knowing up front what their measurement indicators are, you know, their KPIs, if it doesn't meet that, they just get rid of it and move on. Yeah, that's excellent. That's great. Yeah. And I will also say, you know, along the persona path, that's one of the things too, you can always be evolving. Right. And tools like HubSpot have ways that you can track by persona. You can go in thinking, you know, what the persona is, but you're not the customer. You're trying right. to sell to the customer. And so one of the, the great benefits of using tools like that is it, it can help you confirm whether or not your persona predictions were correct or how you might need to alter them based on the data you ultimately receive. And so everything in the process always needs to be evolving. And that's just another place where you can evolve. Well, and that's kind of a flag in the sand for technology. So a lot of times when you get resistance from the technology department, it's because they put off re-engineering things to get to that point. And, you know, and you talk actually in the beginning of your book, you talk about that evolution of, oh, we introduced this bit of marketing technology, and then we introduced this bit of marketing technology. Yes. And then we, you know, and you get to the point where you have, you know, six, seven pieces in your stack and none of them actually work together. Yeah. <laughs> So, fun. so, so yeah, you, you know, CTOs and CIOs need to really stay focused on making that very smooth and systematic so that you can put up an A-B test in, in no time at all mm -hmm. and do those experiments. Well, and I also try and avoid the IT department as much as I can. I know that sounds really <laughs> terrible, but I, I do because I don't want to, in, in, you know, deal with a backlog. And so tools like Google Tag Manager, Right. Google Optimize. These are tools you can implement without much help from the IT department that give you a lot more control as a marketer. And I'm so, again, I don't always say I'm thankful for Google, but I'm thankful for Google's tools in this banner because they have made it so that marketers can actually stand alone on so much work that they need to do on a website that they don't always need to require the IT department to fix things. And that's really helpful. So, do you have any tips though, when you've got, you might've talked about it a little bit, but when you've got some real critical issues that are uh, causing problems for website visibility and you have a backlog and those issues, say you've got, you know, pages that aren't indexed, orphaned, whatever, and you can't necessarily prove they drive to revenue because they're not indexed yet or ranked. I'm just kind of curious how you walk through that and whether or not you have a different approach for an in-house development team or an outsourced development team. So I prefer probably in-house, but I've worked with a lot of external development teams that do a great job. I actually worked with one recently, first time ever, they actually contacted me about page load speed. And I was wow. like, what? Wow. I'm blown away. Like I've <laughs> never had developers internal or external ever say boo about page load speed. So I congratulated them on that. We had added some code to the site for HubSpot and they said, Hey, you know, our page load speed went up. And I was like, well, yeah, it's naturally going to go up a little bit because you've got a third party script on there, but it was within normal range within normal limits. So it was fine. But I, so I've worked with some good ones. I work with some really terrible ones, people who call themselves developers who are definitely not developers. <laughs> and that's one thing I think it's hard today too, is terminology because you've got people who are front-end developers and back-end developers and people who are front-end developers. Sometimes you get people who are really designers who call themselves front-end developers. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that can be a little challenging. So understanding who you're talking to is really key um, to, to getting that success. But one of the things, you know, you mentioned orphan pages and things like that. I like to go extreme, Catherine. I like to just throw it out there. We're going to get deranked from Google. 
our whole website's going to come down if we don't fix this. And how much does that mean in business? What I do know is our website makes this much money today, right? It brings in this much money. It brings in this many leads for the sales team. And if our whole website goes down and we don't have that organic search, then the sales team is not going to have any leads and they're going to be upset and they're going to come knocking on your door. So I like to just kind of go a little extreme if I have to and <laughs> tell this story, paint this picture of doom and gloom as I need to, even though I think, you know, realistically, would Google take down my pages if they saw an orphan page here or there immediately? Probably not, but it's still a best practice that we want to take care of it. So if I find that I need to go doom and gloom, I do. And I always try and, you know, involve the people who I need to involve. But if I need to go higher, I go higher. And I don't hesitate to do that. I have never hesitated, even as an agency owner, to pick up the phone and call the CEO and be like, your, your IT team is not doing what we need them to do. So do, you know, you need to call them and talk to them. So you just got to do what you got to do. Well, and I think at the end of the day, they appreciate that honesty and forthrightness, right? Yeah. It's interesting. You know, we've, we had a client who the CEO, their, their particular niche was disc defragmentation, <laughs> which you don't really think about anymore. But years and years ago, when we first yep. started out, that was a big deal. <laughs> and now your, your computer just does it really automatically and you don't even think about it. But they had disc defragmentation software. And it's amazing what you can share with a business based on what you see in their data. Like looking at disc defragmentation as an example, we could see it wasn't just their brand, it was every brand declining in search. Use it. If we look at uh, Google Trends, yeah. we could see searches for disc defragmentation were going down. And so I let them know that because they, another agency was trying to say, well, see, Janet's agency is <laughs> not performing for you because your searches <laughs> are going down. And I was like, it's not us, it's the industry. The industry is not in a good spot. And we could demonstrate that. And when I, and I told the CEO that eventually they had to part with us because they had to rethink their strategy for their company. But one day I got a call from that CEO kind of randomly. And he said, I want to thank you. He said, because of the data you gave us, we retooled our entire company. And what a benefit that is to be able to help a CEO understand hey, this particular market is on the downward slide. You need to really retool and think about, regroup and rethink about what you can be doing to survive because this is not going to work. That is such a, a wonderful thing to be able to share with somebody. I mean, even though it's a negative news, but to be able to help them guide their business in that way. Yeah, I always find it very interesting how many people and I, this interesting only because I'm an SEO, I'm deep in that stuff all the time, but the audience data that you can get from, or the audience insights you can get from search data and how many marketers just don't even know you've got that kind of freely available data that you can yeah. use. It always surprises me. And to Jim's point, they appreciate the honesty. They're not resistant to it. They appreciate the honesty and the data because it helps them prepare. And I find that time after time is that's really true. So I'm singularly obsessed with the part of your book that talks about the soft skills <laughs> and yeah. in particular soft skills for the people you're going to bring on board. I know you talked a little bit about how you could interview people and especially kids out of college and see if they've got the right DNA to be good as a digital marketer. But say mm -hmm. you've selected a group of young people that are on your team. So they've got through the first vetting process. Is everyone universally able to develop the soft skills to be effective in digital marketing? Do you have any tips or tricks about how to increase the amount of soft skills they have so they can be even more successful? I know you and I have both coached quite a bit. I coach sort of instinctively, but I found some stuff inside your book that I thought was a bit more of a process and I'd love for you to talk about it a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah. So having folks right out of college, what I've also found, but even people who are experienced, depending on how they were taught, really affects, you know, when they came up through educate, the educational system, really affects how they approach problem solving, as an example. And in many cases, I find most people, the educational system in our country generally has us regurgitate answers, right? We study something, we learn it, we regurgitate it on a test, we move on. There's not a whole lot of 
problem solving required or real critical thinking required in a lot of the educational system in our country. Depends on who, who taught you though, right? Really it's teacher based. So one of the things I really do like to use is a Socratic method of questioning. This is where you don't give them the answer, but you ask them why. You just keep, it's like a, it's like a two-year-old, but why? Yeah. <laughs> Catherine, I'm sure you get that a lot. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but really, it's that great kids, kids at two are already thinking ahead and they're thinking in the Socratic method. But yeah, really having them think through the problem. Why is it this way? Why do we feel this way? And you can kind of ping them and help them get to the answer, but really consistently using that method is really key. The other thing that we do in our agency is we have a strategy meeting for each client every month. We call it a brainstorming meeting and we get together and for half an hour, we have a conversation about that client. And we talk about everyone who comes to the meeting must bring two good things that happened and everyone must bring two negative things that happened. And I don't like to call them failures. I call them challenges. What what are we up against? But everyone must bring four things, these four things to the meeting, they must come prepared. So they had to think about it before they come to the meeting. And then when we're in there, it's a really great opportunity for me to coach them. So for instance, I had a great guy working for me. He, he had a degree in analytics, which was awesome. I don't see that very often, but even though he had a degree in analytics, he came into the meeting one day and he says, well, and this was a paid search meeting. He says, well, impressions were up this month. And I said, great. Well, but why were they up? And and one of the favorite answers, by the way, I get from my young folks is seasonality. (laughs) If I hear seasonality again, I might scream into the void. (laughs) But no, impressions might be up because what, what are the reasons impressions could be up? Well, they could be up because you're spending more. Are we spending more this month? Oh yeah, we are. Well, then that may be why our impressions are up because we're spending more. We have more availability. So really digging into him and saying, impressions aren't what we really care about. What we really care about is conversions and rates, not even just conversions, but the rates themselves, because you could spend more money and get more conversions. What we care about are things like, did we improve upon ourselves month after month from a rate perspective? And so being able to be in those types of meetings and coach them in the moment is just so invaluable. I I highly recommend that type of approach because it's worked really well for us over the years. And have you ever gotten to a moment where you vetted somebody, you thought they were going to work, you've been coaching and you decide you have to let them go because they're not working out? Yeah. Luckily, I don't have to do that very often. And I will say that I invest a lot of time in people I would say the the earliest I typically would see that somebody is really not ready to move forward is a year. And so I've seen some people a little bit sooner that I think "Mm, this might not work out, but I keep on working at it. But generally what I find is, especially younger people, stay in a job for about a year or two anyways. So if you find that the person's not working out, they may leave on their own, Mm -hmm. but people who are really invested and are really excited about what you're teaching them and love it might stay longer. And that's been my experience. And you can tell between, I'd say six months and a year, if they're really going to work out because the beginning of someone's new employment is always like learning the ropes, like where's the bathroom and (laughs) how do we check our email? But really six months in, you get a good, start getting a good feel for them. I have had to let people go because I could see in the end, they were not going to progress past a certain point. And that's very hard, but I will say there's another book and y'all are going to laugh when I tell you about this book, but I think I might mention it in my book. Actually, the book is called fire someone today. (laughs) <laughs> and that sounds really terrible. And I felt really bad walking through airports with that book. <laughs> <because I think laughs> people, people thought I was the most cruel person, but it was written by a gentleman who he's a Christian and he ran this Christian software company. It, had, it was Bible software. And so he's a really good person. He really wanted to do the right thing. But what he realized was, and I thought this was a great takeaway that when you sometimes people stay in a job longer than they should. And it holds them back from going into things that they should be doing, that maybe trying something that they would really like. And 
what I've found is people I have let go that I'm actually doing them a favor in many ways. It doesn't feel like a favor when I do it, Mm -hmm. but many people have come back to me later and said, you were right. This was not the right field for me. I found something I love even better. And that's, you you don't want to hold them back from their potential. Sometimes they're holding themselves back from what they really should be doing. So if you know, sooner you know that someone's not a good fit, it's time to let them go so they can start figuring, forcing them to figure out what's good for them. So along those lines, data-driven marketing, it's kind of a new field. If you could design your ideal marketing department, what would be the roles and what would be the positions that you'd look for? That's an interesting question. Well, I definitely want some good data analysts. And I mean real data analysts, not people who say that they're an analyst, people who really know how to read data. We have a degree here at uh, the University of Virginia. I live in Charlottesville and a degree in data science, Mm -hmm. data science institute. So you're seeing more of that popping up these days. I think that's awesome. I'm really excited. I'd like to get people from a group like that, although they might be bored with what I have to give them, but I think that it would be ideal. You'd want a CMO who doesn't have to know everything, but knows enough that can really understand that digital is, that all things in digital are not always measurable as we think they are. And we have a CEO who can understand that too. That's also really key. I think there's a miscommunication or misunderstanding between the CEO and the C-suite and marketing about what is measurable, what is not. Mm -hmm. And there's this concept that everything in digital is measurable. Hmm. Not really. Like during COVID, as an example, we used to measure store visits for one of our clients, (laughs) but because they're doing delivery instead of store visits because of COVID, we lost our store visit visibility in Google ads. So sometimes that kind of stuff goes away and you don't have that visibility. So you have to understand there are limitations But I think a data analyst, a a CMO who understands at least top level, high level, the capabilities of digital and is open to trying new things. I think people who are good designers who like to test, that's always a challenge. You know, sometimes designers can feel really connected to their design and not want to try new things. Mm -hmm. So you want designers on your team who are willing to try new things and are eager and love data to be able to try new things. And I definitely have someone who is a strategist and, and someone to implement, maybe that's a junior person as well, who really, again, understand data and analytics and care about that and look at the, those types of pieces before making uh, decisions so they're informed. And they work with the analysts to do that too. In that kind of collection, where does the psychology come in? Because you know the, uh, a lot of times... Things like conversion will come down to, and you said this before, like, you know, they've measured it pretty well. The biggest thing about a button is how vibrant the color is, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, but the, there's a certain element of both psychology and also being able to sense the, you know, who the customers are and how they talk about things and how they think about things mm-hmm. so that you're aligning your conversion process with the way they think about your product. Yeah, I think, you know, definitely the persona, someone to build personas and work on content is really key as well. I'll let that part out. You know, once you develop the personas and you know who you're writing for, you want to create content that's going to be compelling for them. And that's really an important part of this is it's, it's a really key part of it. And really making sure we write the content and then you have the data analyst helping you measure the effect of that content, but that we can use in our different campaigns. And that's a big part of that. But also, you know, the people involved all need to really have the mindset of testing and continuous improvement. If they're not on that path, you're going to have a difficult time. You know, you don't want to have people who are so married to their work that they can't take constructive criticism. Sort of like running a science department rather than a biology department than it is a marketing department. It and do you is. vet for that in the interview too, the ability to take constructive criticism? Is it sort of one of your vetting questions? You know, I think probably in different ways it is. I don't ask, you know, I think if I ask somebody if they're, they can take constructive criticism, their answer is going to be obviously, yes, of course I can. <laughs> um, but, you know, different people 
look at criticism differently. Some people look at criticism and think it's constructive. Some people might look at the same criticism and say it's not constructive. Yeah. So it's more of a scenario. Like if I told you this, what would you say? And see how they react to that. I've interestingly enough had people try and give me constructive criticism on my website or something like that in an interview. And that's always interesting too, to have them come through. First of all, I'm always glad when someone comes to our website and has investigated us before they bother having an interview with us. Mm -hmm. You know, they know what they're getting into. That gives them brownie points right off the bat. But when they give me constructive criticism, I'm impressed that they're willing to be bold enough to say to me, hey, I saw this on your website. Have you considered doing X, Y, Z? Because I think that would be really successful for these reasons. That is a really bold, awesome move. And that's the kind of person I want to hire because it's somebody who is not willing, not unafraid to come to me and say, I think we should make change. Yeah. Do you have an internal team process that you use to get people comfortable with this constructive criticism if they're not coming from that background? Yes. I will say I've had some people in the past who were very sensitive. And so in the review process in particular, we have really tried to talk about what are your strengths. There's a lot of different ways to look at this. Some people say you should do positive and negative. Some people say you should only focus on positive. Some people try and do the positive, negative, positive sandwich. The reality is I found that just being honest with people, but you want to be very focused on the positive, but also on the things that they need to work on. And I, I don't call them weaknesses. I call them their, you know, here's your next area for development, or here's what we need to work on to get you to the next level. And we try and be as transparent about that as possible. And we measure as much as we can, regardless of the type of skill that they might need. So, and then also in the feedback that we get, this is really interesting because HBR, Harvard Business Review, has some really great little short books, they're like 15 minute reads hmm. on different things. And one of them is how to give effective feedback. And a lot of people give terrible feedback hmm. and they don't know how to do it properly. So we do 360 reviews in our company. And one of the things I train everyone on is if you don't know how to rate someone on this, don't answer it because you should not give feedback if you do not know. Right. But secondly, if you give feedback with a number and rate this person, you must give a specific example of where they did this well or where they didn't do it well mm -hmm. so that they can relate to, oh yeah, I remember that scenario. I remember this situation and it can help them to evolve. I also think you got to deal with it as much as you can in the moment, but on, on reviews, like we do quarterly reviews, which as you guys know, does not happen in most companies. In fact, annual reviews are lucky to be happening, but we do with our new folks, we do quarterly reviews for the first year. Excellent. Yeah. And it, it's very much about moving. It's exactly equivalent to data-driven marketing. It's moving away from the subjective to the concrete. So, mm -hmm. you know, I know in my own experience that, that when I, you know, sit down and, and discuss what's happening, I'm always talking about the things that actually happened, the outcomes that we're seeking rather than, yes. you know, perceptions or, you know, impressions or what have you. And that what, because we want to simultaneously encourage a culture where failure or mistakes are openly discussed about in, in a non-judgmental way, because we all make mistakes and, and things are going to happen. The worst thing in the world is if you try to cover it up. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, the other thing I try and do is make a review, a conversation. Right. It's not just about what I expect as your employer of you as an employee, but it's also about what you expect of me as your employer. Have I not provided something you needed? Have, is the failing of not achieving this particular goal because I didn't give you something that you needed to train? And so we try and have this two-way street and it's worked pretty well for us. Like we had this open-ended question. So we have a self-evaluation people have to fill out before these reviews. And in the self-evaluation, there are some open-ended questions. I was wondering if you can share the tips that you found over the years related to hiring, training, or improving those kind of soft skills amongst digital marketers and the analytic skills. Sure. One of the things that I like to ask people right up front in the interview is if they see themselves as more creative or analytical. And just because you're, you're creative doesn't mean you can't be analytical. Some people will tell me they're both. 
But when people are necessarily highly creative, sometimes they may not appreciate or really enjoy a job that is so analytical because really data first marketing is wrapped up in so many spreadsheets and analysis that you want to make sure you find people who are happy with that type of work. If they come in expecting it all to be, you know, really highly creative, that is only a very small part of the job in many cases. And so we we always try and, and decipher that right at the front of the interview. But also we look for people who have backgrounds in, I found like, for instance, people who have degrees in economics are really good hires because they naturally really enjoy numbers. And so when we look for marketing and economics majors from college business majors, economics is definitely one that that is a really helpful major that we find is really a good fit oftentimes in this type of position. And do you think that anyone can get trained in the soft skills that are required to be a data-driven marketer? Or are there some people that are better set for that? And do you have any tips around increasing their skill set to get there? Yeah, you know, soft skills are tough because there's things that you build over time. They're not something you normally just take a test on, you know, in school. It's not like taking a a hard skill test like the Google Ads exam to determine if you have a certain skill. So for soft skills, there are ways to train people, but some people have more difficulty getting trained. So one of the things that we do in our um, agency is we have a meeting once a month, a brainstorming meeting for each client. And for those meetings, we ask our staff to come prepared with two things that were positive over the last month so they can celebrate their wins, but also two things that were challenges. And as we discuss these challenges and wins, it's a good opportunity for me to see how those staff members are pulling data and if they're recognizing certain information that needs to be pulled. And that's one way that we work on some of those skills. And I coach them in that particular instance. For instance, somebody might say to me, I think impressions were up, blah, 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 blah. And I say, well, well, are impressions what we're going for here? Or is the goal of this campaign something more like conversions? And so it gives me that opportunity to really coach them through thinking through these problems and problem solving. So it's a really great opportunity to really one-on-one, especially when you get to a position like mine where you're CEO and you might be removed a bit from the day-to-day of working with that staff member. It's a good opportunity for me to reconnect with them. Great. That makes tons of sense. Now you in particular mentioned in the book, I think it was a, a grid and a way to evaluate and move people. Now I'm forgetting what you called it in the book. There's a soft skills. Yeah. I remember what you're talking about. This is soft skills, like roadmap. That's it. That's it. And how to really test. We took that from another company that was really generous in helping us with some of this information and really ways to build those soft skills and looking at a roadmap of how you can move past and move forward with that. And we've used that also in reviews to really understand where people are at. And we've recreated a badge system in our, in our company. Uh, This badge system was based off of something Zappos had done with different types of skills. And so we also using that roadmap and using our badge system of have you earned certain types of skills, like are you able to speak on the phone with someone professionally and coherently? Those are obviously qualitative skills. And so we judge those and decide if the person has earned the badge. And that roadmap was really helpful in getting us there. Yeah, I thought that was super useful. I, I've, I've done some coaching, but to see the roadmap, I just thought it was very illuminating. Really nicely laid out, just really clearly laid out for you. Yeah. Yeah. Super helpful. So as marketers, we're always interested in being as close as we can to our end customers and what makes them tick. Have you ever had any recent aha moment about your client's customers that you thought was striking? about my clients' customers that I thought was striking. Or yours uh, as an agency. Oh, my, my customers I thought was striking. Yeah. I think, you know, COVID in general has been a really striking, you know, the past nine months have been pretty amazing to watch people and companies adapt. And, you know, recently, you know, when we look at data, one of the really interesting things that was a, a real pivot point recently 
was one of our clients is in DC. They're, they're an alcoholic beverage company and they used to have people coming to their store. And so store visits was our number one measurement out of Google ads, but they started offering delivery when COVID hit. And so that meant we had to really pivot our measurement because we weren't getting store visits anymore. They were delivering. So now we had to really rethink our, our measurement. And so in particular, COVID has really adjusted a lot of what we've had to think about from a measurement perspective and how we can really judge our success. The good news is things are really great. It just means that you still have to think about, for instance, our store visits really plummeted because of the fact that Google has a certain threshold you have to have for store visits to even report them. And because of the delivery, people were opting in the delivery option. There weren't enough store visits to report on. So it really meant a lot of pivoting, both for our clients and for us. And so you always have to be keeping an eye on that kind of thing, because you just, especially with right now, what's going on in the world, you really don't know how things are going to change and how you're going to have to alter your measurement. No, that totally makes sense. So the top of your funnel just essentially disappeared. (laughs) Or it changed. It changed which which measurement had to become a top of funnel. Did you find a trick for handling phone calls? Yeah, you know, phone calls weren't as hard because we do have the Google ads phone tracking. So that's been very, very helpful. And it even gives you duration. So with clients with phone trees and stuff, you have to really think about that because a phone call that's one minute May need may need to take a minute or two to get through the phone tree to get to the right place versus a phone call, it's 30 seconds. So you have to really understand that pretty well to understand which are really probably true conversions versus which are maybe quick calls to get directions or something like that. Yeah, pretty significantly different from a store visit. Yeah, exactly. And depending on the client, some don't really want store calls. I mean, as much as they want a store visit or vice versa, some want want more calls than store visits, depending on the type of thing that they're selling. For instance, we have a client that is a um, farm implement store that also sells propane delivery. For propane delivery, they prefer phone calls, but for gardening supplies, they prefer for store visits. So even within one client, you may have different data points that you're looking at, depending on what you're selling at that moment, what their real goal is. Yeah, it's similar to when they're all digital marketing, separating affiliation leads from organic leads from ad leads is the equivalent, you know, that's the digital equivalent to phone calls versus store visits versus some other channel. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And they all have different behaviors. They all have different steps before they get to the, you know, the bottom of the funnel where you're measuring conversion. And do you have any kind of back of the envelope tricks for dealing with uh, gaps in those conversion processes? So I'm going from phone now, now I've referred them on to something else. Well, you know, it really depends on the client's back end. Like for a phone call as an example, they may have tracking software, phone call tracking software, where we can see through a phone tree what the requests were. Was it a direction? So they press one for directions. Do they press two for this? So we can get some more information typically from the client in those situations. You know, for store visits, it's a little bit different because you sort of have to make the assumption in many cases, unless the point of sale system has more information or you have a coupon that you're using, like a coupon code. So it really varies by client and what they're tracking systems allow us to see and what they're able to share with us as well. Excellent. So Janet, this has been a really great conversation today. I just wanted to um, wrap up with a couple of last questions we ask everybody. So what is the win or resource that you'd want to share with our audience today? Well, I really would love to share Data Studio, Google Data Studio. We use that tool so much with our reporting. It's a free tool. I think it's a really excellent way to visualize your data. So I highly recommend that. I think it's a great win. And honestly, you know, we talk about in the book how important data visualization is to get people to absorb the data and information you're sharing. So I think that Google Data Studio is an excellent way to do that. Great. And then how can people learn more about you? Well, you can come to our our book website. It's data-firstmarketing.com. 
You can also download a free chapter of the book about culture, which we've been talking about today. You can read that chapter for free if you go to, to bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash D-F-M dash culture, C-U-L-T-U-R-E. And you can download that free chapter and read all about all the techniques and see the roadmap we were talking about as well as in that chapter. Great. That's awesome. And what's your uh, Twitter handle and your corporate address? My Twitter handle is Janet D. Miller. And my corporate address is marketing-mojo.com. Great. Thank you, Janet. This has been amazing. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your expertise with our listeners. It's been great. Thank you so much, both of you. I really appreciate it. And I've had a great time. Thanks so much for listening. To find out more about our podcast and what we are up to, go to digitalmarketingvictories.com. Subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And please, if you like what you hear, spread the word. Rate us, comment, and share. We're always looking for new topics, ideas, and guests. So if you have suggestions, please go to our website or email us at questions at digitalmarketingvictories.com. And thanks for listening.